Hello, and thank you very much for joining me. Um, it was intended that a live recording of the talk from this seminar would be uploaded, um, but there are a couple of glitches with the recording. So this is a re-record of the event. Um, I just want to thank before beginning all of those who came along, all of those who asked questions, whether I answered them properly or not, um, and Joe Rogers and the University of Highlands and Islands for giving me the opportunity to come along and share some ideas. I guess I should probably do my own introduction um, in this setting too. Um, I'm David Gange, I'm a senior lecturer in history at the University of Birmingham and author of this book, The Pride of Antique Edge, which um, I think is the reason I was invited to come and talk um, to the Edge seminar here. So yeah, I found um, this last few years a bit of a roller coaster, moving from very academic history writing into some kind of strange hybrid form and from writing about the intellectual life of cities to writing about coasts. And I'm not really convinced that I ever actually made the decision to make those shifts and nothing about how they've happened was planned. So I'm gonna talk now about three things, about a previous book, The Red Atlantic Edge, um, about the next book project, and then about the kind of framework um, in which those books kind of sit. Um, but I wanna stress that both the books are really tools for trying to develop a framework rather than expressions of an approach that already exists, which explains why they're written as they are with admissions of ignorance at the start and entirely justified imposter syndrome throughout. So they're books that explore a learning process, not statements of results. And I'd like to think it's a strength rather than a weakness of writing in forms that are kind of not quite academic, that it can create speculative space rather than demanding finished arguments. So the Front Atlantic Edge was my move from thinking about cities to thinking about the sea and coastal cultures, um, and was done by kind of the most drastic and immersive means that I could imagine. So the idea was to be low in the water, as thousands of families up and down Atlantic coastlines once were, for a journey from Shetland down to Cornwall. And I really couldn't have made the shift of field without that experience. And um, it's still kind of um, intriguing to consider that, or strange to consider that, to ask in the kind of context of our increasingly pressured research culture, how we relate our non-academic skills like kayaking to the work we do, and how we value the crucial time spent just experiencing stuff. So I kayaked for two weeks of every month for a year. So this route that you can see was divided into 12 legs. And this particular geography has some um, obvious benefits for rethinking the visions of these island groups that are given in most general histories. So seven of the 12 legs were in Scotland. Only one, the very last of them, touched on England at all. And towns were barely a feature of a lot of this route. So I traveled for five months by the time I reached the second town with a population of more than 600, which was Ullapool. An extraordinary proportion of this journey was spent on coastlines where English wasn't a predominant first language, where the regions of Shetland, Gaelic, Irish, or Welsh speakers. And I'd, I'd even traveled for 11 months before I saw the first beach of the commercialized kind where people might eat an ice cream. So that was almost kind of at the end. And I've been realizing over the last few weeks, um, in all the current wonderful work being done to establish coastal history as a field, just how different the coasts that different scholars imagine are. So the coasts I see from the kayak prompt writing about the cliff base as a site of cultural and economic production, or the tiny boat noosed as a kind of family's window on the world. I'm usually a world away from a port town or a stretch of shore that's used as a commercial leisure space. So the first year of this research was spent deep in waves, um, millions and millions of waves. Um, I did almost all the journey alone, but the, um, for perspective, I'm using photos here um, of the short stretches that I did with another kayaker. So I'd obviously done some kayaking before this and we began when my partner at the time had a car accident that left us unable to walk in the hills. I'd never kayaked before um, with this kind of goal, attempting to actually kind of inhabit 
coastal waters and really experience the space of the coast in kind of proper detail. So I've had been in almost all conditions, doing my reading from the boat or on the coastline, I'm spending the night in my waterproof sleeping bag that you can see down on the right here, whether on coastal mountains or um, by the waterside. Um, so I've never really attempted to use extended time at sea to consider how being at sea makes the histories that you see really different. Um, and doing this journey obviously involves passing lots of time with other species, which I think of as a kind of crucial historical um, aspect of the worldview that the book creates, especially since a fundamental goal for any historian is surely to find ways to work out what it feels like to kind of shake yourself out of the time you write from a little and living a life really intertwined with other species kind of on their own terms, um, where they are kind of much more comfortable in the environments that you're, that you're in than you are, um, I think is a great way to do that. So here, a minky whale that almost um, knocked me out of the boat, and here, um, a kind of typical kayak view, really low, looking up through swell at um, the creatures that actually inhabit this water, and also that connect us to the kind of historical um, context that we wrote about. But the journey also involved lots of time meeting people. So this is an image from a day that saw some of the starkest contrasts that I've ever known. So it was a, brief, a kind of bleak and brutal nine mile crossing to Tory Island across a stretch of um, quite vicious ocean, during which I promised myself that if I survived, I would never get in a boat again. Um, and it, but it led to one of the warmest social evenings imaginable because I unwittingly arrived on Tory Island on the birthday of the King's daughter. I still find it really odd that this year at sea was perhaps the most social year I've ever had. Um, and it was, the journey also involved lots of time using archives along the coasts. So I knew there were going to be lots of archives on this route. But I hadn't gathered till travelling just how rich and wonderfully staffed these have been. Used to the often rather impersonal experience of urban archives, they have value of long serving, um, extremely knowledgeable archivists embedded in island communities was quickly evident. It's sad to hear. Um, how many cuts there have been since I did this journey that mean that many of the archivists that I spoke to who really knew these archives backwards have had their hours reduced or um, roles removed. Um, and with this incredible resource as the archivists, I found myself behaving in archives entirely differently from how I usually do. I've, being so used to that impersonal experience of urban archives. Um, so I can only compare um, how I was approaching this maybe to something like a Labrador puppy running up to show archivists things I got excited about and inevitably then being shown a dozen more exciting things. The first time that happened was in Shetland archive. So the journey had begun under these huge wheels of gannets um, in skies where donkeys would try and put them out of the air um, with hundreds of hawks and fulmers around too. And after the kayaking, I went straight to the archives. Um, and in between reading articles from about 18th century Shetland, um, I happened on about 18th century Shetland, um, I happened on a little poetry pamphlet called Praising the Guga by Donald Murray, who I thought lived on um, Lewis. In it was a poem called um, sorry, a pamphlet called Praising the Guga. I managed to confuse my hope there. Sorry, I'll say I happened on this pamphlet called um, Praise the Guga, and in it was this poem um, called The Craftsman's Prayer. And it was one of those things that I got excited about. Um, it resonated really beautifully with my experience of the coast from the kayaking. So I ran across to um, Blair Bruce, the archivist on duty, um, and yeah, showed, showed this to him. And his response was, oh, Donald's just up the road, and his favorite coffee shop is right across the way. Um, should we give him a ring? So shortly after we were having coffee, I had permission to use that poem at the beginning of my chapter and all kinds of new points of connection. And so I tell that 
brief story um, to show how kind of in this project there was a there was a core of traditional research um, the documents the oral history collections the photos in the archives but it was all the extra stuff that bobbing about on coastlines entailed that made it the immersive learning experience that it was so the next project a float aims to extend that immersion to the whole North Atlantic world and to extend considerations of the relationships of human, landscape, um, environment, animal, um, that Kayak Atlantic Edge began to explore. It exchanges the modern kayak for 10 highly localized styles of boat and the full color aesthetic for something a little more silvery, fitting to the kind of um, traditional boat styles involved. And it will also have a little more um, traditional artwork. This is an um, example by Fiona Black. Uh, it's about oars and paddles though, rather than about sail for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. So I was able to start the project just before lockdown um, on the water in the midst of those incredible February storms that we had. And telling you a little about the first part I was investigating should help show something of what the project actually is. So I was in this region of um, South Connemara, shown here in a map of Galway Bay trading routes that I borrowed from um, the really excellent PhD thesis um, that there's a link to at the bottom of the screen there. Um, and this is a region that is notorious for its really brutally rocky shore. The kind of coast that, that would shred a traditional curra in moments. Also an extremely ungiving land, as noted in the 1880s. It seems incredible that any sustenance can be gained at all amidst this wilderness of rock, rivaling Petra in its barrenness. But here, a large population exists. An island's agrarian economy on which the state would soon be built um, might as well be on another planet. But the region was noted for the vast diversity of the waterways it had and for the sophistication of its maritime life. It's also one of those regions where um, the water with all these kind of complex inter-island passages with unique kind of tidal conditions um, is named and known with at least the detail of a complex set of crossing and roundabouts in Swindon or Milton Keynes. And the highly localized variety has meant that really specialized boat types have never been replaced by mass produced craft here. So unlike on almost all European coastlines, you rarely see a carbon fiber, a metal um, or a plastic boat amongst the hundreds of wooden ones. It's also a coastline on which distinctions between urban and rural spaces don't really exist. Mm -hmm. So um, houses are scattered across the coast. So you rarely get either long unsettled stretches or kind of tight town clusters. So every family or community would have a boat that suited its particular kind of access to water, whether a tiny rocky cove or a large formal jetty. Or anything in between and there's still today no road access to lots of the places that families then live. The specific boat I was exploring um, is a Galway hooker and the hooker tradition underwent a revival after 1926 as leisure boat rather than work boat and there's now a really glorious um, scene that celebrates traditional boats in this region. These hookers are distinctive because of the way they combine immense practicality a huge carrying capacity, um, sometimes said to be up to 20 tons, with an almost ridiculous flamboyance on the water. So it's, it's kind of as if transit vans have been in, designed as the most elegant boats, boats, as the most elegant vehicles on the road. Um, since the revival, any list that you see of the types of hookers includes four boats, um, from the full-size Bordemore down to the little log-rigged hooker. If you go back before 1940 and look for similar lists, they will include not four boats, but five. And the fifth boat was the Boromara. Um, it was unique to this region of South Boromara, where it did the work done by Curras elsewhere. Its form was just as elegant as the Galway hookers, so and even sturdier. So it had all of those beautiful sweeping lines um, that hookers are famous for, there's supposedly never a straight line in one of them, and it has that extravagant curve inwards at the top, the tumble hole, which is the explanation for that 
combination between elegance and um, and carrying capacity. Um, but these boats, um, the rowing boats, were far heavier than most rowing boats usually are, to the extent that they demanded oars 18 feet long to row. And that means that these are spectacularly ill-suited to leisure boating. This isn't a boat that anyone could jump in once a month. Only really consistent use would allow people to build the capability of rowing it far. Um, so when these were working boats, the Bordomra was crucial to the Galway hooker trade, navigating shallow coastal waters to load up the sailboats and rowing peat out to the Aran Islands when weather wasn't right to rate the sail. So it was crucial in enabling the communities scattered along this coast to live how and where they did. And it's really worth remembering that until the um, addition of engines, um, communities that relied on the sea had to have alternatives to sail. Only now the hookers are leisure boats, just out in convenient weather, rather than work boats forced out every day, is it plausible to use only sail? So there isn't a single wood armor still in use. Of the many that I visited, this in the foreground was the one closest to being seaworthy. So I spent my time hanging out in workshops, I have an almost infinite number of photos of me looking goofy with a boat and its builders, um, including with this boat, which will eventually have a sail added and um, be a hook and, but for now, before the mast is in, is essentially a little board armor with an added weatherboard. And I quite enjoyed the fact that whenever I approached boat builders, they were surprised to find someone mentioning the board armor. And the first response I got from one boatman was, no one's interested in that. It's, you know, the donkey boat. Why would you write a book about donkeys? And donkeys are obviously great, but I think that phrase reveals a lot about what I'm interested in. So the appeal of the family's um, noose jetty or inlet rather than the ships and ports, and about the ways of being, the relationships that a small boat like a family donkey could be the agent of. And I think there's an entirely understandable misrepresentation inherent in most maritime history. Um, because it tends so frequently to be about sails and steam. Wherever we have statistics, small road boats vastly outnumber sailboats. The first date we have Irish figures for is 1836. Um, and at that date, 73% of boats surveyed were small open rowing boats, whereas only 2% were decked sailing boats. And while in Ireland, I looked through recent boat surveys and found the same surprise repeated in every single one, and the number of rotting hulls of road boats along the shoreline, including the board armor. So the most recent such survey contained the phrase, the number of board armor came as a surprise to the survey team, even those with an intimate knowledge of the area and its boats. Um, why it's a surprise every time, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But yeah, one reason for all this misremembering um, must be the fact that the archive is dramatically skewed in the opposite direction. So the 2% of deck sailing boats account for much more than the 73%, more, much more than 73% of the archival record. And because of that more direct involvement in formal markets that they always had. And our methods as historians are made to suit those sail filled textual records. So the Bordomra provides, I think, a really useful case study for exploring the cultural and economic dynamics of survival, revival, memory, and forgetting. And the stories that circulate amongst current, current boat builders with their beliefs about ties between boat forms and place, boat use and community, become their own kind of archive. Okay, so um, what can these small boats do for us and what frames can we fit them in? So what I'm hoping to do is to find a method for placing the small boat traditions of Atlantic littorals into kind of one frame. Um, recognizing, of course, the extreme difference of these different places, but trying to understand um, what connections we can find between them um, to, to make sense of shorelines as a way of interpreting histories. So that's, this is shorelines from Ireland to the Maritimes, the Eastern US and the Caribbean and kind of 
um, Greenland and Faroe along the way. So considering these coastlines, almost all of which the centralized urban focused economies of the post enlightenment world found really difficult to integrate and used lots of violence to coerce as having some things in common. So kind of parallel experiences of the edge that were strongest wherever life was lived through small boats. But each chapter is going to be intensely localized, beginning from a boat journey in a specific localized boat, and most importantly of all, drawing on intellectual resources from the short stretch of coastline in question. So building the picture in both practical and literary terms from the smallest scale possible. And like the Freight Atlantic Edge, this has to be a hybrid work. It's not really history because so much of what it involves lacks a written source base and it relies heavily on memory, story and experience. And again, it's treading on terrain that has the potential to be really, really problematic. Um, so the English guy living in Birmingham, um, deciding it's okay to write about small coastal communities he's never lived in and deciding to tackle together a vast range of communities that had really different relationships to such things as colonial power. And I think the only way to responsibly find a way past that has to be through two things. Firstly, extremely self-consciously placing the voices of people who do live on these coastlines at the center of the writing. And secondly, reading lots and lots of theory. Given how much post-colonial theory has insisted that all thought is place specific, a journey around the North Atlantic presents us with an array of different shoreline philosophies to think from and to kind of place it in conversation with each other. So I want to finish by talking about where I think the ideas for making sense of small boats can come from. So there are some really obvious starting points for everyone writing about place, work, craft and movement um, often starts from. The work of Tim Ingold, perhaps the most obvious, but it's now become really notorious just how terrestrial Ingold's work is. The way he dismisses all travel over water in just a single footnote of his main book on movement has become really iconic of that fact. So there at the bottom of the screen is that quote. This is not to deny that people may also travel by sea, but the liquid medium erases all trace of the activities that have taken place there. Thus, land is to sea travel as writing is to speech. There have then been plenty of sociological and geographical efforts to add water into this fray. Um, many of these operate in the same kind of intellectual universe as Ingold. So I'm um, evoking Hegelian dwelling, um, Melo Ponti phenomenology, um, those kinds of things. And these are all really, really fantastic studies, but they still often make sense of coasts with the exact same intellectual resources we might use to make sense of the Alps or of Leicester. Um, and I think that coastal thought has more power to fragment established intellectual traditions than that implies. Um, and this is something I think that a lot of people are, are just beginning to think through at the moment. One of my own favorite ideas, I don't know why I said my own there, but one of, one of my favorite ideas um, that underlies the Connemara chapter in particular is the idea of potential history. Um, and the first prerequisite of that is that we need to abandon um, all directional thinking. So abandon the directional thinking that has been so central to um, post-Enlightenment European thought. So any writing about small boats, I think, has to abandon narratives of progress, of development, of modernizing and civilizational thinking. We have to, for instance, puncture the myth that subsistence is primitive and growth-based economics is advanced. Um, it involves a realization of just how deep rooted those kind of narratives still are in so much of our history. Problematic narratives that um, were constructed as much by Marx as by Adam Smith as by Toynbee. Um, and one example I often use to try and illustrate the persistence of directional thinking is the way um, historians whose focus is on urban Britain still write about the education acts of the 1870s still reading them as a step forward towards universal literacy, a directional, if not linear advance, 
And the, the acts are really frequently critiqued. There's lots of debate about them, but that's primarily for the unevenness of the application and for kind of some of the ideological content. Um, yet, as soon as you view them from Gaelic speaking regions, these acts appear entirely different, kind of violently forcing conformity to ideologies of nation and industrial development that now look more like wrong turns than the step forward that still often presented as. Hence, why Papa Macintosh called these acts the most serious blow that Gaelic suffered, more even than the clearances or even the terrible toll that was taken on Gaelic speakers in the First World War. My point with that is that even though most historians think we're rejecting directional narratives, the perspective from the edge is really important in revealing ways in which that rejection is incomplete. Until we see British history through eyes of the Orkney Cup trade or the Gallic oral tradition, through the eyes of First Nations or of um, peoples of the Caribbean, we obviously can't comprehend the dimensions of British history at all. And the most interesting thing about the Education Act, I think, is the pocket of cultural resistance to them. So we can ask what kinds of imaginative thinking become possible when we've effectively either flattened out or pluralized those narratives, taken away their progressive shape. So in the Fred Atlantic Edge, I expressed this idea of potential history in a way that ended up being quoted in reviews. And I really desperately wish that I'd written these sentences better without the stupid mixed metaphors. Um, so here it was anyway. Um, the past is full, not of dead things, but of unfinished business. Germs of fruitful roots as yet untraveled. Every coastal ruin whose living cultures were once steamrolled by the homogenizing logics of industrial capitalism is a site at which the possibilities for an escape from those logics can be entertained. I have no idea what germs of fruitful roots means. Um, how that metaphor was supposed to work. Sorry. Um, but that, that kind of perspective, um, if not the way it's written, is drawing on the work of two of my favorite theorists. One has little directly to do with Ireland. Um, she's the theorist of photography, Ariella Azule, whose book, Potential History, came out a few months after the Freight Atlantic Edge and is absolutely the masterpiece of this kind of writing. And Azule argues that our approach to the archive cannot be guided by the imperial desire to unearth unknown hidden moments. It should rather be driven by the conviction that other political species were and continue to be real options in our present. The other slightly older text situates us in ideas issuing directly from the coast of Connemara. And this is David Lloyd's Irish Times, the Temporalities of Modernity. So in Lloyd's potential history, our present um, a world reliant on the assumptions that an integrated global economy must double in size every 30 years is a kind of single toxic offshoot from multiple living pasts. So it's the product of wrong turns that began for Lloyd with the attempt to spread enlightenment political economy to every inch of the earth in the 18th century. And one of our roles as scholars, he says, is to imagine alternatives, the potential futures of those prematurely severed pasts. The new political economy made itself seem inevitable by trying to discredit um, all competition, dismissing the cultures of Atlantic Island as backwards by judging them only on its own terms of surplus and productivity. Seeing beyond that myth of inevitability reverses our usual assumptions about time. It makes pre-modern pasts real and alive with potential futures. It makes the future real and alive if linked to those many pasts. But it makes the present a kind of unreal dead end. The Lloyd Irish West Coast landscapes, and particularly Irish coastal ruins, show us this. He says, if the work of modernity is in effect to obliterate both the memory and the present consciousness of its violence, and to naturalize progress as the self-evident form of human time, then the ruin stands as a kind of uneroded sill that both recalls destruction and comes into conjunction with the obstinate refusal to accept, the obstinate refusal in the present to accept that there are no alternatives, which I think is a kind of gloriously rousing quote. I also think that the countless hulls of old boats on coastlines are very much Lloyd's sills. 
recollections of um, of a kind of particular vibrant world of life that is worth exploring, not just as historians, but about people thinking about the future too. And I also wonder whether um, the technique for building these boats, in which the rotting fragments of a century old vessel become the frame that guides the gradual construction of a new entity, um, each thwart or rib being carefully imitated to generate a new form. I wondered whether that too is a metaphor for Lloyd's relation of past and future. Um, so that kind of perspective is where chapter one of our globe will end up, before each subsequent part adds new layers of alternatives to the continental philosophical tradition. Um, so the most extensive and powerful of the, these traditions is obviously the body of transformative philosophy to have come from the Caribbean since the 50s. It's ongoing work that's given a host of different labels, almost all of which invoke inshore waters. So terms like archipelagic philosophy as opposed to continental philosophy, hydalectics as opposed to dialectics, as Cameron Braithwaite put it, shoreline thinking um, and tidal relationality. And this work is really unusual in Atlantic studies because it actually uses the Atlantic to think with rather than seeing it simply as a space between continents. It uses water um, creatively rather than kind of passively. Um, it sees the sea as different because of its rhythms of dissolution and recomposition, its dynamism that facilitates mobility but jeopardizes deterministic movement. Um, and yeah, the variation and multiplicity that the sea brings. It associates European imperialism and Western dialectical philosophy with grounded solidity and assumptions of permanence, of universality, and of forward linear movement. So it produces an alternative to dialectics, calculated to capture the experience of archipelagos of small boats, through metaphors of tides and tidal time that moves backwards as well as forwards. The most famous figure associated with this tidal thinking is Edouard Glissant, um, whose work has, over the last decade, been given the really serious expository reading that has confirmed his place as a major philosophers of the 20th century. So um, books like these. Um, he insisted that a defining feature of any philosophy was where it begins from, and that to begin from the shoreline of Martinique was to begin from the trauma of the closed ship on the Middle Passage, and that such a beginning presented two possibilities of a new creative tradition built through the pluralities of small inter-island open boats, um, but with its own um, threats and challenges of migration and so on um, written into this too. And many of the leading anti-colonial thinkers of the post-war decades were in Glissant Circle in the Caribbean, including people like um, Franz Fanon. So there's a very real sense in which the shoreline thinking and coastal history of that moment is a key starting point of a really substantial range of current thinking um, that can build for us a pluralizing coastal vision. So most of that um, current pluralizing work is no longer formed around the watery imagery of its early manifestations, um, but some of it is, um, and much of that which is, uses water to explicitly link the experience of the whole West Atlantic seaboard. Um, which brings us to the other body of thought that I want to mention, which is that of the Canadian Atlantic. So lots of the best work today that thinks through subsistence um, comes from Canada. It's been a, a really big um, area of research interest in Canada in ways that it, are much less frequent um, on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, the work that thinks through humans as material things that are continuous with the processes of water, so our skins as shoreline edges, often also began in Canada. And um, Astrid Nemanis is the philosopher of the permeable edge today. So this is really significant work for thinking through um, what shorelines are, what cultural meanings they have, how humans are kind of connected to them. I just added a quote to the bottom of this slide from 
from an article co-written by Mnemonis called Weathering, and that quote is just there to illustrate how much some of her work um, begins explicitly from that um, situation on Atlantic shorelines. Um, then the work that conducts autoethnographies of the shoreline and of the wave um, tends to come either from the Pacific or from Atlantic Canada. So um, in the Pacific, I'm thinking of people like um, Karen Ingersoll and her fantastic waves of knowing, um, but then from Atlantic Canada, the work of people like um, Sonia Boone. And there's also a host of work that builds on indigenous thought to undermine European visions of human separation through the life of sea and river. Um, so things like Otter's Journey or Zoe Todd's um, Fish Philosophies. And this is a kind of ontological rewilding um, that doesn't have any of the strange imperial undertones of so much mainstream rewilding rhetoric. And yeah, I think it would be absolutely fantastic if in our rewilding rhetoric we were able to think a little more kind of theoretically and philosophically imaginatively about what we want that work um, to be doing. But perhaps most significantly um, of all for this project, Canada is the one region, the Atlantic, for which the relationships between small boats, identity, society, indigeneity, and colonialism has been really deeply theorized. So inheriting a canoe paddle is a kind of autoethnography of coming to anti-colonial awareness of the appropriative nature of the canoe as symbol of the Canadian nation. And the classic coyote and raven go canoeing is now one of several texts that makes indigenous ways of being and knowing into not just its content, but its form. So it's written, it's an academic text written um, through orality rather than through the conventions of literacy, which are um, conceived here as being an imperialist tool in themselves. So I think these texts offer us lots of starting points for thinking about the work small boats do as symbols everywhere um, in Shetland, in um, Faroe, um, as well as in Canada. Um, it, and it's obviously a truism that you need to learn to write again almost from scratch for any new book, but it feels um, particularly apt for afloat as it did for the Frayed Atlantic Edge. So um, this project is aiming to be a strange mixture of approaches and ideas that are going to need to be held together by some kind of writing style. Um, a pattern is going to have to be found for allowing the warp of journeys by boat, experience, phenomenology, um, to blend with the weft of these shoreline philosophies, um, like these Caribbean and Canadian ones, in a way that can combine into an attractive enough fabric to reach a trade press market. And trying to find that style, um, trying to explore ways of tying these things together, feels like a really big part of the adventure of setting out on this project. And the question is, does thinking with the shoreline, thinking with the edge, still offer us the possibility for a plurality um, that it offered someone like Glisson? How can specific philosophies built from specific coasts, whose very specificity is their purpose and their power, be brought into conversation in ways that tell us something about thinking with shores, about being on shores? How can we use the idea of potential histories to approach vigorous past societies in ways that don't idealize the past, but instead show us how many of our familiar assumptions serve to dangerously idealize the present? And how can we use those histories um, to generate um, productive ways of thinking um, for our futures? So I'm gonna stop there um, and stop the recording. I'm sorry you're going to um, miss out on the questions that were asked in the seminar, uh, but thank you very, very much for listening if you got this far. <laughs>